Hello. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for the invitation to come here and to present my a little bit of my life and my work, and, um, and to be with my friend Jimena. That's the most important thing. Um, I'm the daughter of Baron Tissam Bonemisa, and I grew up, and not as a child, but as, even as a baby, surrounded by <laughs> amazing art, art collection uh, that my parents um, had put together. And my grandfather had started this enormous collection, primarily of Dutch uh, landscapes and Dutch uh, mas old master paintings uh, from also from Spain, from France, from England, and also very early Renaissance paintings. My grandfather was a huge collector of early Renaissance, and um, we lived in a villa right next to a beautiful private gallery, which nobody had any access to. This was completely closed to the public. And in those days, I suppose the word of a pinacotheque was really more appropriate. It was like the private collection, like a cabinet of curiosities of great paintings. Where which, was this? Well, it was in Lugano, in the Villa Favorita in Lugano. And uh, well, you all probably know the rest of the story that it was brought to Madrid and now lives in the Villa Hermosa and is now on view in Madrid. But in those days, we could only show a very small fraction of the paintings in Lugano. So of course, the museum here in Madrid is an incredible opportunity to understand the, the chronological history of collecting of three generations. So I'm the fourth generation collector. There's a big gap between the 1970s American pop art to when I started collecting in the beginning of the 21st century. But was, so your, was your father speaking about, his, uh, about the art he was owning? Wait, or? My father was completely obsessed with collecting. <laughs> and it's the only thing he discussed at ever. Um, and he had five wives. And I think all of them collected a little bit with him. <laughs> so the tastes went here, and then they went there, and then they went everywhere. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was an incredible journey to see all this happen. But the incredible, the thing, I mean, you asked me, you know, what is the paintings and what were the art works that influenced you? And I think at a young age as a child, you don't really appreciate, you don't really understand, you don't really look at these paintings. In the, in the sitting room where we lived, we had a second apartment there, and there was amazing paintings of German expressionists, which my mother was passionate about. And so my mother was quite an adventurer and sort of dragged my father out, out of what he considered in those days, you know, only the, he wanted to put back together the collection of his father, which was dispersed after my grandfather died. So which is why my father was so obsessed about keeping the collection together and why it's now in Madrid, was because he spent his entire life trying to, back, to buy the paintings back from his sisters that then they sold it, and then he had agents all around the world sort of trying to make sure that they, if they, one of the paintings of the collection came up, that he could find it. And of course, in the process, became very passionate about it. But it was his friends that I remember the most. I mean, we always had a dinner and at lunch, fueled by copious amounts of expensive French wine, incredibly interesting people there. So it was always a trip to go to the Villa Favorita, to be invited by the Baron to have, and you know, we had many, many great friends. And, and you know. Kids, and the kids were part of it. That, that's what's fabulous. You were, in, you were in the middle of all this incredible crowd. I mean, I wasn't in the middle of it. Let's face it, I was like in and out of it. If I was allowed to join the table, and you know, I wasn't allowed to speak at all. <laughs> yeah. I, I was allowed to listen, and you know, I was always a bit noisy and a little bit, you know, redhead. <laughs> but you know, it, w it anyway. The, the thing that I took of all of that was how important people are, and how important relationships are in the art world. You know, we can all enjoy our collecting, and we enjoy the relationships with artists, which we're going to talk about. But it's friendships and and people 
coming from very, very different backgrounds. Like Jimena and I completely on, not only geographically. So you are building a very special project. I would like you to tell us about it. So what, what you, where, where shall I start? <laughs> because there's from a the few beginning. Like, from the beginning. So if you'd like me to, to I, I brought some, uh, yeah, he's going to help me here. So I brought basically eight artworks that I commissioned over the years from some that I did in out of 2007, 2004. This was actually the very, very first commission that I was invited to cooperate with, which was with the Carnegie Foundation and uh, Art Angel in London, which is an amazing commissioning organization. It's an artist called Kudlu Gataman from Turkey. And he did this project about the Kurdish minority inside of Istanbul, which he basically infiltrated for two years and created a whole series of interviews. And this was done, in two, this is over 10 years ago. You know, when I think about what's happening in Europe now and what's happening to the Kurdish people, it's, it's a very valuable piece. Christoph Schlingensief was actually an opera and film director that walked into my office a few years ago, and he says, I don't ever want to do an opera again. He had a huge fight with the people from Bayreuth, and he did The Ring in Bayreuth, which was probably the most prestigious opera in the world. And he would, said, I want to be an artist. So I said, okay, I'll make you an artist. But you have to start at the bottom. So we did this project in Iceland um, at the same time as a big festival of Dieter Roth. And I thought that this language of Christoph Schlingensief worked really well with Dieter Roth. One of the very early artists that I started my collection with, which is Janet Cardiff. This is a huge installation, the biggest one she's ever done. It's like 90 speakers. This is an installation in the Armory in New York. And it, you could hear a pin drop. This is a sound installation by an incredible artist who's having nightmares, and she recorded all her dreams. She had a, like a little microphone next to her bed when she woke up from her dreams. And you can hear these recordings, and they're very sort of daunting and, and spooky. This is the piece installed in the Hamburger Bahnhof. Um, I, I have to continue because yeah. the slides are continuing. Just give uh, me a second. <laughs> no, but okay. the, the first uh, installation doesn't come like that. I would like to know how it begins. Yeah, but let me just run through okay, There's three more, and then we can okay. talk about it. So, you know, Janet was an artist that I saw in the P uh, PS1 New York in 2001, and she completely blew my mind that how sound can become an art, is an artwork, and how it transforms your experience of art. She's an incredible artist. Walid Rad is an um, Lebanese artist who just had an amazing show in MoMA with these works. Um, we co-commissioned this with the Wiener Festwochen. It's called Scratching of Things That I Disavow. It's part performance, part installation, part magic, part um, videos. So it has a lot of moving parts. It's very interdisciplinary, and it tells a story about um, art in the Middle East and all these sort of bubbles of Abu Dhabi museums and, you know, kind of this artificial creation of culture in the spaces that where it doesn't really belong. And I mean, he's an incredible and extraordinary artist and I've been working quite a long time with him. And the last, I know you'll probably notice, was quite very political, all of this. This is Amar Kanvar. Anubar Kanvar is again invited to be in the next documenta. He's been in the last four documenta. So for 16 years, he's been in every documenta there is. And he's always been very political. Documenta is a very engaged art event. Um, this is a project called the Sovereign Forest. Oh, no, this is the one. Actually, I don't know which one. This is Sovereign Forest, the one before was about Burma, which I wanted to do as a statement about the revolution and the, the um, political demonstrations that were in 2008 in Burma when Aung San Suu Kyi was under house arrest. And this is a project about a huge mining exploitation in the province of Orissa in India. And these are 250 um, types of rice that were collected, where I actually hired, a, we collected, we both 
um, invited an Indian farmer to collect all these different species of basmati rice just to demonstrate how, you know, we all buy basmati rice comes out of the supermarket, but in India, basmati rice is as, as varied as wines in Spain and in France. You've got all the different chateaus and all the different wines. In India, rice is the same. This is Ernesto Neto, just recently in Vienna, and we in traveled to the Amazon jungle with him. We were invited by the Huniquin tribe. We understood of their incredible spiritual relationship to the forest and to the environment. And they also practice with ayahuasca, their connection to medicinal plants. And we created this installation. It's a kupi shower, which is a representation of the spiritual home of the, of the Huniquin of all the Amazon tribes. And it was a really cutting sort of difficult project because it's very uncool to sort of bring people from the Amazon out of their context and put them on show in a kind of exhibition. But we, because we engaged them so much, they gave a lot of talks, they did a lot of ceremonies. We had a lot of workshops with all the uh, difficult, different medicinal practices to extract these medicinal properties from the plants, which is something the Brazilian government just has forbidden that they have the right to not only exploit the Amazon jungle for its resources, its fossil fuels, and it's and creating all these dams which are destroying so much of the Amazon, but also they privilege themselves to take away all the medicinal properties of plants and give nothing back to the Indian communities. And here is the yellow corridor property of the Verges collection installed in the most spectacular Baroque palace in Vienna, which just is about to close. If any of you have nothing else to do next week, I would rush to see it. And this is, again, another work of theirs, an incredible, this is a very early work of Olaf, it's the first piece that I ever saw of his, called Blue Cristalline. These are all installations, but the most amazing thing is that this is the most beautiful palais in Vienna. Um, as you can see, totally crazy Baroque. It's the first time Olaf has ever been exhibited outside of a white cube. And he's gone, we've put him in the most beautiful palace built by Prince Eugene. He was the famous prince who, together with Sobieski, protected Vienna from the Turkish invasion. So there you go, it's another piece of history. So this is um, a major work. Again, I'm only showing the Verges collection this time, as I want to show, our, again, another collaboration with Argentina. This is extremely important. This is, you've got one of these on your seat. This is a new lantern that Olafur has designed, which we're creating a, instead of an exhibition or workshop. And the people that are going to put this lantern together are 50 refugees that have just arrived from Syria and from Afghanistan. And we're very curious to invite anybody who would like to have this project. It can be modularly reproduced. We're going to also install it in a, a camp, one of those dreadful camps in, in Lebanon. Olafur has done this totally free of charge, and you can buy one of these lanterns, or you can donate the money for the refugees. It's going straight to helping them reintegrate into our city, and we're teaching them German, we're addressing women's questions, we're having workshops, we're showing them films about how the Western culture has visualized so many of their traumas, and their, you know, I've got so many, a huge video collection actually of many um, films that were made by famous artists about the situation in the Middle East. So I'm an extremely political person and I fight for the environment. I, I believe that we're on a very treacherous path and whilst we all want to have a tremendous amount of faith in the future, I turn to artists to help me articulate my political and my environmental views and I think the art, artists that I love and cherish the most are the ones that have a tremendous meaning to me. And I found one just walking in the fair today, so even in an art fair, there's one called Asuncion Molina uh, Garcia. She's actually in the competition. So if anybody's here looking at trying to vote on who should win the competition of ARCO, she's an incredible artist doing an amazing project on global famine. It's the first thing I see in Travesia Cuatro. So you know, even in these art fairs, there are lots of artists doing very meaningful projects that have a lot to say, and I spot them right away. I was in the fair about 10 minutes before I found this one. 
So that's me. I'm very <laughs> engaged. <laughs> Thank you. But to begin again with the beginning, I, I, I would like the public to understand how you, co you come from being a regular collector to this kind of huge adventure and how to decide to commission project this kind of huge project like that. So Wha I remember I, I had an exhibition uh, in the Mori Museum in uh, Tokyo and after this huge opening, it was an exhibition that 300,000 visitors came to see. It was like unbelievable. And Mrs. Mori took me to lunch in a really nice little tiny Japanese restaurant. And then she leant across the table and she asked me, tell me, Francesca, how do you come to collect such great, huge artworks? <laughs> I never <laughs> thought about it <laughs> until she asked me. And you know, she said, and you're a woman on top of it. You know, how does a woman do that? And of course, in Japan, the relationship between men and women is kind of different. But yeah, it struck me. How did that happen? And it's because I'm a, I'm a, um, I want to tell stories. And the artists are the most powerful storytellers in the world. And you shouldn't, you know, we all, I mean, if you, if you know artists, you probably, all of you know artists, you trust them. Mm -hmm. I don't tr trust a lot of people, but I trust the artists that I know. And I think we all have to be able to sit back and let them do the talking because sometimes we make mistakes or we say something that we later regret. But if artists are given the opportunity to speak through their language, their visual language, I mean, that's what we're here for as collectors. I mean, sorry, I don't want to compare us to the Medici's, but you know, they kind of started the trend, didn't they? <laughs>